The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. This next month of February, we're going to be focusing in on uh, the nation of Cameroon for our surprise around the world. But Geraldine has been, and her friends have been gracious enough to help us with, with Cameroon the month of January. And it's been very, very helpful as our topics of teaching have intersected um, you know, some of the things that we, we can learn from Cameroon. So we talked about uh, busyness in Cameroon compared to busyness in America as we went through our Breaking Busy series. And now talking about dating, I just kind of asked Geraldine this morning, I said, well, you know, I, I don't feel like you're doing enough in church today. Uh, so why don't you help me with my message too and tell me like if, if I were a single man, which I'm glad I'm not, but if I were a single man and I wanted to go get married in Cameroon, what would the dating marriage process look like in Cameroon? So she, she, she explained a little bit to me. I'm like, oh, they got to hear this. So give, me, give us a minute on that. Okay, good morning, church. He thinks I don't know enough here. Um, okay, so if you had to date in Cameroon, um, first we date hidden. Your parents, they don't know what you're doing because your parent is definitely going to bother you if they know you're going out with a guy. So we eat like hidden dates and when the guy feels like he found the one, he takes her home and the mom now is in charge of like, she's the person who actually determines if she's the right person for him. So he takes her home and she would, the girl would come home from time to time to do like chores and go to the farm so you can, because they pay right prices for us, the girls in Cameroon they are really expensive. <laughs> If you plan marrying a girl in Cameroon, you might want to get a second job. <laughs> so, and when you say bride price, you mean that I, the groom, and my family would have to come to your family and be like, how much is this going to cost me? Because I really love you, right? Right. right. Okay. That's it. Just want to clarify. Yeah. So, um, you have to put your best for a person to put that much money on you. So, um, the dating, the, uh, the, the, your stepmother now is a person who actually determines your, your fate, so you have to be your best to actually get married. Yeah, so then it's just hidden, then you come home and show your best, and you, somebody determines if you're going to get married or not. So my mom here, she's definitely going to learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you very, very much. Now, compare that. I mean, that's, that's a very different world than we live in right now. Obviously, we've never had in America a bride price, uh, but uh, in, in, in some cultures, it's a dowry, or uh, the, the, the woman's family actually brings an amount of money to the, to the marriage uh, culture that varies around the world. But we, 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 we see some commonalities from where dating used to be in, in America, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but c compare that with what you just heard with a, a couple that might meet today at the beach. There's a cookout on the beach, a pair of 24-year-olds show up, and their eyes meet across the bonfire. Both of them are from out of state, and they stayed in town for college. They started talking. They walked along the beach, splish splashed their feet in ankle deep water, and told each other at least the good parts of their story, the parts that made them look really cool, and not the bad parts that made them look a little bit disturbed, as we all have our own dysfunctions and problems. And then we, they decided that they, they needed to exchange numbers so that they could text. We don't talk anymore. They decided to text. And after a couple of weeks of romantic texting, they decided to get together and sit across a coffee table and text each other for a half hour of intimate texting. And then they decided that they'd actually go on a date where they'd look at each other and talk. They went out to dinner, and dinner led to dinner and a movie. And for the next several weeks, uh, they would go to every new release movie that came to the local theater. They went to every coffee shop in the suburb. They, they, they went, spent more days at the beach and did more walks at the beach, spent more and more time together and shared more and more things together. And within a quick period of months, somehow they, they looked at each other and realized that this special someone is the one. And so they decided that they would go and meet each other's family and share the news. It's possible today to get married 
with very little contact between the families of those who are involved. It's possible that you get married by spending uh, most of your time alone as a couple, and that's a very, very new phenomenon in our culture. Dating uh, is a very, very new thing, believe it or not. And we're going to kind of walk back over the, uh, kind of the context that we came from, because I think if we understand a little bit about how relationships have worked throughout, you know, thousands of years of human history, and even into the early 1900s, we're going to have a better bearing to understand some of the differences that maybe there's some things that we don't want to lose, that we've lost. And if you think more fully about why you're doing what you're doing, it's always a good thing. And if you can even factor in God's wisdom, it's a great thing. So I want to talk about the process of courtship. Courtship has, it used to be all there is. If you wanted to get married, you would find a courtship process. You would court someone as a man. You would identify a girl that you, you, you fancied, but you wouldn't simply engage this girl directly you would go through the proper channels of, of maybe having your family speak to her family and, and asking for times in which you could be together with their family. It was careful. It was the, the goal was a careful, methodical, deliberate selection of a mate. The goal was marriage. You were looking for a mate. And you would spend a lot of time with this person's family because family approval, as is currently the case in Cameroon, as you heard, was paramount. This was not just a couple decision. In fact, marriages, even, even in our context, used to be primarily arranged. You would envision, now this is a big difference, as you're look, evaluating this person, as your families are evaluating this person, you would envision not a romance, but you would envision a family together. You would envision building a home together. That's courtship. Now, that, that, that hasn't completely gone away. I mean, these things still are involved on some level of the relationship. But starting sometime before World War II, this started to mutate into something different. If you're taking notes, you can just kind of follow right along in the outline inside your bulletin. Dating shortly before World War II. Now, I'm not saying this is your grandparents, how they met. Maybe you, your grandparents had a, a very cool classic love story. Uh, but this may have been their experience. Uh, dating before World, II, uh, World War II took on kind of a popular uh, cultural theme where you would date to rate and you would rate to date. In other words, you wanted to be seen in public with as many people as possible so that you looked popular, so that you looked important and looked that you looked courtable. So your way of looking like a good potential mate, and not that the goal was sex or marriage in, at this time, but you wanted to at least be eligible and the way that you showed your eligibility was by being seen with as many people as you could. And so you would do things like if you're in college and, and you're home alone in your dorm on a Friday night, you would leave the lights off even if you sat in your room so that you looked like you were out. You would do things like you would have your mother send you flowers so that you looked more attracted by others, attractive to others, uh, rated you so that you kind of rated higher in the estimation of others. Dating originally, and <clears throat> this is where the word comes from, dating used to be something that you would arrange a date with a prostitute. That's where the word came from. And eventually, dating came to be like, lo like lower class, peasant class people would start doing social outings with others, and then it came to the middle and upper classes. Uh, but before World War II, it was, it was focused on doing, doing things in public to be seen with as many people as possible. Then in the 1950s, men came back from the war in Europe and in the Pacific, and there were 250,000 less men than before the war. And so this cultural phenomenon took place that said, you know what, there are less men out there. Ladies, you better hurry up and find the one for you. And so people started getting married more. This led to the baby boom, of course. So the marriage age drops now to like 20 and 21 for men and women, or 20 and 22. And yet the rate climbs. So more people are getting married way earlier. And what does this do to the going steady phase? Well, if marriage used to be a little bit later, but now people are getting married at 20 and 22, now the going steady kind of season happens in your teens. And so suddenly, for the first time ever, it was common to have 12-year-olds going steady. How many of you had a girlfriend or boyfriend when you were 11 or 12? I guess me and Tara are the wild ones here. <laughs> we got, we, let's, let's swap some stories after church. Uh, I, I don't know about you, my fifth grade class, nobody was, was going steady in my fifth grade class, and we thought something was wrong with us. 
So one girl was moving out of town. She's like, you know what? I'm going to get this class grown up before I leave. So she's like, will you go out with so-and-so? And will you go out with so-and-so? Let's get this thing started. So by the time we were all in sixth grade, we all had our special someone. We would wear each other's, wow, the guys wouldn't wear the girls, but the girls would wear the guys, we didn't have a letter jacket, so it was just some cheap jean jacket. You would give each other jewelry on the holidays, and you know what we would do? We would mimic marriage. Going steady couples mimic mimic marriage. You, You would wear his letter jacket. He might wear your, you know, chain you bought him. People would see you as an item to, 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 to not get in your way and, and try to pull you apart. You would spend every waking minute together. Oftentimes, other relationships would fade away or even completely be minimized because this is your item. And you would mimic being married. And of course, that leads to having 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 or more mini marriages before you actually get married and mini divorces before you actually get married in which you have maybe bought property together, you bought a TV together, you, you uh, have each other's clothes or property at your house and you have to figure out how to divide up the assets and friends that you had together after your relationship's over. So after this point in history, people got used to having many, many marriages and many divorces before they ever got married, oftentimes starting in their early and pre-teenage years in which the focus on the relationship was different than it would be in a courtship process. The shift, let's talk about the shift. This shift, you can see in five different ways. Number one, you had many pre-marriage partners. This is a very, very new thing in human history. This is not normal around the world in places like Cameroon, and it's not normal for this place except for very recent history. Those dating relationships would focus on couple outings in the community as uh, the community started creating entertainment options. That was the focus of this relationship. The two of us will go to the movies together. The two of us will go to a restaurant together. The two of us will go to the mall together. And, And instead of the two of us spending time with one another's trusted family who would thereby serve as the filter, focus, and guide, and wisdom for our relationship. So the couple became isolated in romance and outings rather than family gatherings. And there was a a whole culture of public advice that rose to the surface. Now you could buy a magazine that would tell you everything you needed to know about life, love, and marriage so you don't need your parents. You could get Ann Landers' column in the paper to ask the questions that you could otherwise ask grandpa. You could watch the TV show about uh, uh, dating. You could, you, could, you could listen to kind of uh, psychologists and counselors and sociologists. Uh, the, and so you would know everything about the opposite gender that you would maybe have to learn from people that have been down that road. And so public advice started replacing the wisdom of family and trusted mentors. Romance became the, the, the target and focus of the relationship and then the songs we sing about relationships rather than building a family. People didn't think about their spouse or their, their date as a, as a oh man, she is going to be a great wife someday. She is going to be a great mother someday. He is going to be an amazing father. He is going to be just this, this rock that I am so excited to build a home and family with. The focus was I can't wait to spend my life with this person. I, I, I'm excited being with this person. But romance became separated from building a family. And finally, sex, in this same period, for these reasons and others, for the first time in history, has been, was separated from the lifelong commitment of marriage. So that we've gotten to a point where most people don't even know that sex is, is finally reserved by God and created by God as a gift for marital relationships. And when you tell someone that, as I oftentimes do as a pastor when they come and ask me, they're, they're surprised to hear that. Because we've just been kind of floating with a culture that doesn't realize that, that's forgotten that. That's the shift that we've seen over the last 100 years. And so today, you, you can have people who really have, have a, feel a strong amount of pressure to date, but don't know why. We can have people who are excited and eager and have memberships in 18 different online dating sites, but really don't know why they're doing it. They're just supposed to. And they're afraid of going home to their family reunions because someone's going to ask them if they're married yet. And someone's going to ask them if they have a boy or a girlfriend yet. And they don't want to be asked. And they're not sure why they're supposed to. They just feel like they're supposed to. 
You can have a couple different reasons in this culture for dating. Number one, just to hook up. Physical relationship, sexual, sexual activity. That, that can be just one goal that some people have. I've talked to many people who are so sick of that. I, I read an article recently in Relevant Magazine about a lot of college students are just kind of like um, feeling like that now is such a dominant uh, strain of how 20-somethings think about relationships that there are actually more people abstaining from sex in their 20s than ever before because they just feel like everybody's doing it. I want to be different. And they've seen the pain that comes from no commitment sex over and over again that they're like, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that for me. And, and, and so, so some date for that reason. Others date for just, I just want to have fun and hang out. I just, I'm, I have no real reason to date, but I just want to do it to have fun. And then others date out of desperation. That there's a loneliness, there's, a, there's an insecurity, there's a feeling of maybe pressure that you feel like, I am this old. I am already 22. <laughs> I'm in my 40s. I, I'm divorced and I'm, 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 I'm approaching my 60s. And if I don't have... I don't have time to be single. And so they date out of desperation, and that's dangerous because when you date and when you're in a relationship with no boundaries, where you're afraid to do anything, say anything that might cause that relationship to get lost, you're willing to stay in the relationship for reasons you otherwise might not. And so you build an unhealthy relationship from the ground up because you're desperate. So these relationships, these reasons for dating, I call godless reasons. They're, they're reasons that don't reflect the reality of God in your life. Think about it. God is all commitment. We have the most amazing God because when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always till the very end of the age. When I forgive your sins, I will forgive them as far as the east is from the west. I will remove my, your sins that far from you. And he has never, ever broken a promise and he never will. So how do you date without any commitment? How do you start relating to people with having no value for commitment? You can date just to have fun and have no vision for the relationship. The problem is that isn't how God created relationships, and that's not how he relates to us. Jesus didn't come down, become a human being, just to see what happens. He actually had a vision. He had tons of fun, I think, and his goal for us is joy forever, but there's a very distinct reason and a focus for what he did. And he didn't do it out of desperation. He had, he had a very clear boundary so that when people asked Jesus to do one thing or another, he could say no because it wasn't healthy for him or us. But when you, reflect, uh, when you don't reflect God in your relationships, it becomes godless relationships, and it looks like one of these. So here's my question today. Today, I'm aiming more at single people, and next week, I'm going to be aiming more at married people. So uh, I hope you listen wherever side of that you're on, because God's probably going to put someone in your life who maybe is in the states you're not. So listen for wisdom to maybe be able to share or to be able to empathize with someone who's in a different place than you are. Um, but if this is where you are today, listen closely for yourself as well and for people who are in that same place in life. What would God not God less, but God filled dating look like for you single people. God wants to married people to date too, so you're not off the hook. I haven't dated as a single guy for almost 17 years, but God still wants me to date my wife as a married man, which again, we're going to talk about next week. Uh, but what would God filled dating look like for single people? And the clue is you need really good Christian pickup lines like, like these. Okay, so something like that would be a good place to start. <laughs> my, my favorite was, I put the stud in Bible study, <laughs> and I want to hold you accountable. You have my permission to use those this week. <laughs> Especially you married couples, you got to have fun, you got to spice things up, you just need good Christian pickup lines. So that's free, okay, that's just free for you, go for that. Now to the serious part, I want to give you, as we conclude today, I want to give you four quick things that I believe will really help as you consider dating. As a single person in particular, you're going to find that this is going to help at any stage, but especially for singles. Number one, I, I challenge you to see dating as a time to develop character. I challenge you to develop character before you date and as you date. What if that was your main goal? Like, you know what? I, I'm not ready for marriage right now. I'm, I'm 13. I'm 23. I'm 33. I'm not ready to get married. 
But you know what? I'm ready to develop character because someday I might be ready. And when I get to that point, I don't want to look back and say, I played like a teenager all throughout my teens, 20s, and 30s, and now I have to pretend to grow up. We have a lot of grown-up boys in our culture who just never learn to not be an adolescent, who never develop character. Ruth, story of Ruth. Listen to this brief uh, uh, snippet of the book of Ruth where a woman develops character with her mother-in-law before she even meets her would-be husband. And in fact, it's the whole reason that he finds her beautiful. Naomi is from uh, Israel. She goes to a place called Moab with her new husband, a Moabite man, non-Israelite man. They have two sons. Those two sons get married to Ruth and Orpah, Oprah's ancestor. And um, the, the two boys die, so now these girls are stuck. They have no men to provide for them, and in this culture, you needed that. I mean, no, that's not a patriarchal statement. It was a patriarchal culture. And so these two women are going to have to figure out, they have to get remarried to new men. That leaves Ruth without a husband and without sons to care for her. So she says, I have to go back to Israel to find, probably to, to either beg or to find someone who will take me in. So she says to her two daughters, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. There's just, no, there's just no other way. It's just the cold equation of you need someone, I need someone, and this isn't gonna, you can't just stay with me, I can't provide for you. Go get married, and I'll, I'll go back to Israel. Orpah says, okay, I'll figure that out. Ruth isn't having it. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. What if we taught our teenagers to think that way about their family so that they could someday be that kind of spouse? What if we, 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 we focused on relationship, but focused on being so ready for a relationship that we didn't have great gaps in our character so that we couldn't admit we were wrong, so that we couldn't focus on putting the other first? Because every step along the way, we did things that built the character we would need for our relationships. Eventually, Ruth would meet, meet a man who could not believe her character, who took them both in. But it was because she planted these seeds. And then Ruth's great descendant was King David, whose great descendant was Jesus Christ. Part of Ruth's legacy is Jesus Christ. Big things happen when you develop character. Putting others first looks like this. It doesn't look like ignoring your own needs. This is how you can develop character today in your relationship. Empathize and prioritize their needs without neglecting your own. Jesus says, if you want to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. Well, that goal then is finding yourself. And you can't pour yourself out to serve and love someone without having an intact self, healthy, vibrant, energetic, and full to be able to offer yourself to someone. And so how do I, as a human being, prioritize and empathize this person's needs above my own while not neglecting mine so that I can only do it for a little while and then I'm bitter? How do you do that? That's character. And if you can develop that, that's not easy and it doesn't happen by accident. If you can develop that, then you are going to be the best spouse in the world. You're going to be the best person to date in the world. The, one, the first person I ever hired was a youth director named Brian McGinnis. I checked one reference, and he was hired. You know what his reference told me? He says, if my daughter was old enough, I would want her to marry Brian. Done. If he impressed her dad that much, then I'm hiring this guy. That's all I needed to hear, because that was character. Character is 90% of the equation. Talent's 10%. Secondly, harness friends and family. I'm not going to belabor this point much longer. If you just focus on public entertainment or 
hanging out on that, that, that basement couch watching Netflix for your courtship, your dating process, you're going to miss out on the wisdom and the, the perspective of people that you need to be able to understand your relationship. Think about it. When you're dating, when you're engaged, when you're newlywed, you, you are infatuated. You don't see clearly. You see your relationship through rose-colored goggles. And you need people who know you well and care about you well in order to give you the perspective you need to be able to see the relationship clearly, not through the fireworks, chemical-based, rose-colored glasses lens. Spend time with one another's family. If your family and your friends all think this is the wrong person for you, you're going to be glad you spent that time with them. You're going to be glad you had that perspective. And don't avoid it because you're not sure if they'll like this person. Push through that. Harness that. Isolation is your worst enemy. A uh, quick two verses that kind of honor and affirm that. Honor your mother and father that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. God doesn't just say listen to your parents so that they can be happy. It's listen to your parents, listen to the wisdom of the trusted elders in your life so that you can be happy and have life. Or, if that's not good enough, Proverbs 30. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens in the valley and eaten by the vultures. You get the point, right? <laughs> so listen. Don't be isolated. Thirdly, very important, let your physical intimacy mirror lifelong commitment. This is one of the greatest gaps in our culture's understanding of romance and intimacy. And if you're in a place where you're being intimate outside of a marriage covenant, I, I, I don't know and I'm not, this is not personal. This is just, this is, this is truth. And I want you to know truth so that you can shape your future decisions, not just condemn your past. But let physical intimacy mirror the lifelong commitment that you have with this person. So a little chart. I like doing this with, with youth. Um, look at this chart. Lifelong commitment is on the left. Uh, friends, zero lifelong commitment. Dating, zero lifelong commitment. It's going steady, you can do that at age 12, there's zero lifelong commitment. And you're engaged, now there's a progression of lifelong commitment. Now you're actually setting a date. Now you're actually buying flowers and organizing things and you're starting to build a life together or buy a home together and you're starting to get to the point where you're, you're expanding your lifelong commitment, you're moving that direction. So there should be a progression of intimacy. If you're not able to hold one another and, and, and love one another in physical ways during your engagement, you're, you're not necessarily keeping up with the progression of commitment, but you're not yet committed. I've known several people whose relationships, the marriages were canceled. Okay, so sexual intimacy then along that. In those first three stages of relationships, you should see yourself as preparing you for another. My job, if I'm your friend, date, or going steady with you, my job is to prepare you for another because chances are you're going to be married to somebody else. But as we're engaged, that progression begins. Uh, a couple of other uh, taglines. Many people pretend to be married when they're single and then pretend to be single when they're married. You build the character now, and then you make the bed you lay in, no pun intended, when you're married. You can't start over and erase those things. It takes a long time to unlearn a lot of bad habits. It's very difficult for me to look into the eyes of someone and say, I'm going to never have sex outside of our marriage when I've been having sex with this person outside of our marriage for a long time. It's tough because I've never learned to say commitment comes first. Most of the time when I tell people that as a pastor, they kind of say that doesn't apply to us because we really, really, really love each other. And then I see them again in five years and they're struggling because of infidelity or one level of, of issues or another. And they have to now learn the character they should have put time in learning before they got married. It's going to happen sometime. Why not learn it first? Personal and relational growth are limited by no commitment sex. They just cut off that growth. And so if you don't believe me and you're, and you're in one of the relationships where you're not married yet but you're physically active, I just say this to couples. Just take it out of there and see what happens. See how long you could last. See if your character is enough for your relationship. And if it's not, you've learned something. You either need to do some work or the relationship isn't what you thought it was. Lastly, real briefly, I'm invite the band back up. Uh, have a non-Hollywood vision for marriage and don't hide it. I, I've talked to, to people, uh, women especially, who say, I, I want to date, and I don't want to just date to hook up or have fun, or um, I don't want to be desperate, but guys don't want to hear that I want a, a, a family. That turns guys off, and I don't think I'll be able to date anybody if I tell them that. 
And my response to that is, that's a good thing. You don't want to be with someone who wants to use you. You don't want to be with someone who has no character. And it's worth holding out and waiting and developing your own character until that, and putting yourself in environments where you meet people who, who can mirror that and challenge that to grow. And end with this scripture. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it's not just that family, friends, and trusted people are for dating, it's for life. God wants us, like we're talking about in our DNA groups, God wants us surrounded by people who can challenge us onward on our journey to following Christ through life. Let us then throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He had a vision. It included sacrifice and suffering, but he had a vision that guided how he lived. And that's how he calls us to live. Last week we wrote mission statements. We've got an article on our Facebook page and on our blog if you want to learn how to do that to set your life on a mission. Very, very important. We're going to stand right now and dismiss. And I'd like you, if you feel and have time to stand and and sing our final closing song with us, I'd love to do that with you. There's communion to my right. If you'd like to receive the body and blood of Christ as after this last song, you're welcome to do that. Come forward and receive prayer and then put your name on the map, your tag on the map where you live to challenge your family to be a lighthouse in your, in your neighborhood. Let's pray, and we are dismissed, as, but if you can stay and sing with us, please do. God, thank you for your vision. It's way better than ours. Your vision for my job, your vision for my family, your vision for my life, your vision for my body, your vision for my marriage, your vision for our sexuality, your vision for our community, your vision for our church, your vision for this world is so much better than ours, Father, because it's an eternal vision. It's a forever vision. And God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you don't let us settle for a lesser vision that's desperate, dull, and deluded in our relationships in particular. Pray for those in this room who are carrying heavy relationship burdens today, feeling cut off from a a hope that they once had. Show us that there's a bridge, that bridge's name is Jesus, and fresh starts are ahead. Build the character now in us as we sing in Jesus' name.